Hi, I'm Colleen and welcome back to my channel. If you've been following along in my series of making an 18th century historically accurate-ish costume, then you'll be glad to know that this is the final installment on that series. It is my first time of making a complete 18th century costume from the skin out. So if you haven't already seen the other videos in the series, make sure you go back and watch them because all of those pieces are important to creating this finished look that I'm gonna show you today. This video will focus on making the outer petticoat and the bodice. And I'll also show you some of the accessories that I'm gonna use along with my costume. I made a bergere hat and I have some historically adequate shoes. So let's take a look at what I've made. Before I can get started with planning out the petticoat, I need to fix this bum pad again. This is like the third time I've adjusted this thing. Um, but what I realized in my last video is that these parts right here really just come too far forward and they end up giving a lot of bulk right at the front of my hips, which doesn't look so hot. It makes me look like I'm wearing an inner tube around my waist. So I'm happy with the back. I think that looks the way it should, but these are just too bulky. I feel like I want to end the bum pad right here, honestly. I feel like I want to like cut this whole chunk off, but I don't know that that's right. So I think I'm gonna try and put more tufting here to mush it down some more and see if that helps. But I need to have this measurement around my hips figured out before I can cut this because I wanna make sure that number one, I have enough fullness around my hips. And number two, the length depends on how it lays over this bum pad. Currently, my measurement is 50 inches with this. I'm not so concerned about reducing it. I just want that fullness to be at the back and not here on the side in front of my hips. So let me see what I can come up with. I ended up with 15 tufts on each side and that cut down that hip measurement by three inches. So now instead of a 50 inch hip, I have a 47 inch hip and the bulk in the back stayed the same. So those three inches came off of these two side pieces and I couldn't be happier with that. So I'm gonna move forward with this as my bum pad and based on those measurements, I'm gonna get started on the petticoat. It's time for me to cut out my skirt panels for the petticoat. And this is the fabric that I've chosen. It is 60 inches wide and it's pretty heavy. So I think it'll hold its shape well and give me the look I'm going for. Plus it was in my stash, so I'm not gonna argue <laughs> with having this material at the ready. And there's plenty of it. So because it is 60 inches wide instead of a traditional 44 inch wide, I'm just gonna do two panels, one for the front and one for the back. I started by making sure that the fabric is on grain. I have 41 inches from my waist over the bum pad to the length that I want, but I'm gonna add an inch for the hem. And I don't need to add a seam allowance at the top because it is um, going to be encased in twill tape or a waistband or something, and I'll figure that out later. So anyway, I'm gonna snip into the selvage right at that 42 inch mark. And now you'll see how easy it is. I'm just gonna tear. So there's one panel and I know it's perfectly straight and I know that it's perfectly the length I want it to be. So it's on grain at the top and on grain at the bottom. I'm gonna do the other one the same way. Here's where math comes into play and I wish I could say that I enjoyed this part or that it was easy or that I had a handy formula to give to you. I don't. But basically, you just have to play around with it until you get to the right measurement. Here is one half of the front of my petticoat, and I'll explain just a little bit about where we started. So I marked the very center of my 60 inch panel, and that's this mark right here. I'm actually not sure if it shows up on camera, but that's this mark right here. That's the, that's the middle of my 60 inch panel. And then we want a four inch total box pleat. So I marked two inches here and two inches here. Okay, that's where I started. Now, I know that my waist in the corset is 33 inches, give or take. I'm gonna measure this out to be 34 inches for my total waist measurement and this petticoat. And that way, each of the sides can overlap just a little bit so that you don't see my under petticoat and my pocket and that kind of stuff underneath, uh, like in the slit in where the panels go. So just to recap, this petticoat has two parts. It has a front 
and a back and they tie separately around the waist. So I'll try to show some pictures up here on the screen. It's a little hard to visualize if you've never seen it before, but basically each panel needs to be half of your waist measurement and they tie separately so you have a slit in between each panel in order to reach in and grab something from your pocket. Okay, now that we've established that, if each panel is to be half of my waist measurement, then from this center point to the edge needs to be one quarter of my waist measurement. So for me, that number is eight and a half inches. I started pleating from this two inch mark. So I left the center here and started pleating from the two inch mark going toward the back of the petticoat. And I played around with different width measurements until I ended up having a nice set of pleats that got me to that eight and a half inches of measurement. Now this is eight and a half finished inches. So I don't want to account for the selvage because that will be folded out of the way. So there we go, eight and a half inches from here to here once it's ironed down. I used this handy pleating gadget and for me in order to make this work I did one inch pleats which means that it's taking up two inches with every pleat that I make and that should look really good. I need to do that on the other side. When it comes to the back you pleat it just a little bit differently so I'll show that when I get to it but in the meantime this is how this great gadget works and I got this in a box of old sewing supplies. This is handy because it's got it measured out. It is a Clinton pleat maker and I don't know, I don't know where it came from. All right, remember from the center to the, we're folding all the pleats to the back. So on this side, they went this way. And now on this side, they've got to go that way. So I'm gonna just at that mark, fold up my first pleat, okay? So one pleat takes up two inches total of fabric and I'm going to stick a pin in there. Okay and now I'm just going to continue on doing that but allowing for that to overlap. So see I can just kind of eyeball that I want it to look about the same as the other one and I can pin that. I have the other half pinned and before I pin these down the rest of the way I'm going to just do a quick check and measure whether this equals 17 inches, which is half of the waist measurement that I'm trying to go for. That's great. I'm gonna go ahead and tack these down so that they are even down at least a few inches from the top because I'm gonna to have to level the hem. That looks really good. That's the first half of my petticoat pinned and ready to base down. The back is a little different. I did the same thing where I marked at the center of my panel and I'm going to mark two inches out so it'll still be a four inch box pleat. But this time instead of pleating toward the sides like we did on the front we are going to pleat toward the center back. So each of these sides needs to go this way toward the center back. Okay so it looks a little different. This All right here's the back finished. The rump that they are using or the bump pad that they are using in the book is a split bump pad and mine is not. So I got to thinking that that gap or that box pleat might look a little strange on my bump pad. So I just went ahead and took up that extra little pleat. That's the back and here is the front also 17 inches. So you can see the difference in how it's pleated. These go to the side seams like this and then from the side seams in toward the center back. Let me tell you all of these pins are a stabbing hazard. I'm sorry for the terrible focus but what you see me doing here is hemming the petticoat and I'm using a catch stitch so that's the motion that you're seeing me do here. It's a great stitch for a heavier fabric and for hems and here you can see that it's really neat uh, it kind of crisscrosses it's sometimes called a herringbone stitch and you can't see it from the outside. Now I had to have my son help me with leveling the hem. I am pulling it up underneath a piece of twill tape tied around my waist until it's all even at the hem. And no we didn't coordinate our clothes he just happened to match. But he's telling me when it's even at the bottom and I'm just pulling it up and pinning it to the twill tape. This process was surprisingly easy and it actually didn't take that much time at all, but I am glad I had help. So now that I have it leveled, you can see that this is the front, which needed to be quite a bit shorter than the back. 
in order to have it level over the false rump. So what I'm going to do now is stitch along the edge here, trim away the extra, and then flip that around and stitch it on the inside. I actually ended up not doing it that way. I just bound it with the twill tape because my fabric was too heavy to turn it to the inside. It's time to start cutting out the bodice. And I learned my lesson from the other simplicity things in this group that the measurements want me to cut out a size 20, but in reality, I probably am somewhere between a 14 and a 16. So I have spent some time measuring these pieces and this is the si uh, bodice side back and the bodice back. And together at the bust line, that equals the 17 inches that's across my back. So this should work widthwise across my back. My arms would measure fine for a size 14 sleeve, so this will be good to have the 14 arm side across the back. Now on the front, that's where I carry most of my bust measurement. If my bust is 42 inches, and I know 17 is across the back, that's 25 inches in the front, which does put me closer to a 20. But the way this is worn, it is over a stomacher, and it does give you some space to play around a little bit with the um, opening here and you can kind of adjust it to fit you properly. So I don't wanna to go too big and end up, you know, not seeing much of the stomacher. Plus, if I go really big, it's gonna mess up the arm side and I'm gonna have trouble fitting those sleeves. Plus, 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 I know that up here in my shoulders, this is gonna be way too big if I'm cutting it at a 20. So I'm gonna to have to shorten it anyway. So I think what I'm gonna do is give myself the width here and cut this up on both sides up into that arm side, just so that I have enough to get a good fitting arm side and then I can just kind of adjust it on the body. So I think that's where I'm gonna start. 20 for the bodice front and 14 for bodice side back, bodice back and the sleeve. I'm gonna obviously sew a mock-up. But you can see here that this sample that they sewed does not fit her properly right here. Do you see that wrinkle? That's because the arm side is too low, which is really common on modern clothing. And um, you get a lot of range of motion if you have that cut way up into the armpit, but modern clothing doesn't really give you that. And so now you can see right here, there's a terrible wrinkle and that is not a good fit on her at all. So plus on her, this is closing pretty close in the front and I like the look of this a lot better, but even she has a bit of a wrinkle up in the armpit area. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave the arm side really high on my mock-up and cut it down to fit my body rather than whatever the simplicity pattern says. The other thing I'm gonna do, plus, 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 is once I get my mock-up made, I am going to make some of those adjustments that American Duchess has posted online to make it have a more historical look and feel. We'll cross that bridge after we have a working mock-up. I've completed my mock-up for the bodice and I was pretty much on the right track. So I have a size 14 in the side back and back. And then in the front, I had originally cut a 20, but I ended up being more like a 22 from here to here. And I adjusted it to be more like a 14 up here in the shoulder, um, just because I wanted to have this look where they're fairly close together. Um, I just didn't want the, that point to be so far apart. So in order to accommodate a larger bust and get it to where I wanted it to be, I adjusted it here. I also made my usual changes of shortening the waist. So I took it down maybe a full inch in the waist and I adjusted the shoulder strap for the slope of my shoulder and I raised the arm side. It was far too low as the pattern is written. So I probably added a good, at least a three fourths to a full inch all the way along in this bottom part of the arm side. So I'm happy with the fit enough to move on to a boned mock-up. Now, this is my petticoat fabric and I'm going to also use it to make the stomacher. Now I hope to make a wearable mock-up out of this fabric. So it's a nice compliment. And if I'm gonna go through the trouble of boning it and really working on the fit, might as well make it something I can use. So this will be a wearable mock-up for this. And then any adjustments I need to make, I'm also gonna then make on my final fabric, which is this. And I have just enough of this fabric. I don't know how 
historically accurate it is. I just love it and it's been in my stash for a long time and I want to use it. So I have just enough to make a bodice out of that and that'll go really well with my burgundy shoes uh, and black ties that I have for them. So that's my plan. I'll start with the wearable mock-up for here and then make the final out of that. I had to step away from this project for a couple of weeks and I can't remember where I left off. But essentially what I did was I made a mock-up and got it to where it fit using the pattern pieces from 8161. But American Duchess, who designed this pattern, also has a web page, which I'll put a link to down below, that shows you how to take this pattern and make it more historically accurate. So this is where I started. There was a piece here, seamed right along this white line, and a piece here. This is the back, and this is the side back. American Duchess has you move these seam lines over and create more of them. So you can see I just cut this apart according to the American Duchess adjustment. And then I added seam allowances to those pieces and created new pattern pieces here. So she goes into all of that on the instructions for making it more historically accurate. You can take a look at that, but this is what you end up with. And you get the seams along the back that would be very historically accurate for the time. So uh, modern patterns are trying to simplify these historical shapes and do as few pattern pieces as possible. But if you really wanna take it up a notch, you do need to have these design lines in there in order to really get that look that you want. Another adjustment is to move the shoulder seam to a different angle and slightly back. So you can see here, this is on my new pattern piece and it is slightly different from the original. So this is what I'm working with. I have my front, side back, and my three pieces for the back piece. So here's my progress. I went ahead and cut out the lining now that I'm confident with the fit and I added boning. Instead of making the lining in the same number of pieces that I made the outside in, I just took a tracing off of the final garment and made it all in one piece. And instead of having a center back seam and sewing down the seam allowances to make boning channels, I just sewed on a piece of twill tape and made the boning channel. So I've got two pieces of boning here. And then the pattern did not call for boning in the side seams, but based on how it was fitting me, I really think it needs it. So I'm gonna go ahead, well, I have already sewn boning channels here, and I'm gonna go ahead and stitch those in. So my next step is to stitch along the front, on the top, and then back down the front, and then turn this whole thing, and then I can base the armhole closed and finish off the bottom edge and then I can set the sleeves. So that is my progress for today. Just a quick check in here. I have put in the lining and put in the boning on this wearable mock-up and I have a mocked up sleeve. It's too tight and I also think I'm going to take off this sort of pointed area. Uh, let's see if I can get in here. It's got this little like point and there's a there's a dart here to make it sort of go around the elbow and I don't think it's going to work very well with the shift that I have which is ironic because this is the shift that goes with this outfit but as we all know I've had problems with the shift so currently the sleeve is a little too tight but it fits in the sleeve or the arm side pretty well so I'm going to make it a little bit bigger in through here just so it can go over this uh, shift that I have because I am not going to make another one just yet. And then I'm going to add the ruffle that is supposed to go on here so there'll be two layers of ruffle. But you can see once I lace it over the stomacher, which I have cut out but I have not sewn, the fit is quite nice. And uh, even like I have motion in the arm, I don't have any issues with that. I'm trying to figure out these wrinkles whether they're problematic or not, but I have not clipped the seams on the, the arm side yet. So I think once I get them clipped and it's fitting better in my armpit, and once I get this tied or laced over the stomacher, I think it's gonna be okay. It may be still just a touch too long here in the waist. So the problem is, you can see my ties and I can't get it tied tight enough 
to make it not fall down just a little bit, right? So if it were up here, you would never see it. But as it is, if I move at all and shift, this eventually does show right here, this twill tape. I'm trying to figure out whether at this point I can add the skirt on. Um, I don't think I have enough fabric to make the full gown, but I might have enough fabric to put on a little bit of a skirt, which would then make this a non-issue and it would also help pull that down a little bit. But anyway, I do think once I get it laced and the sleeves in there all the way, that will work. But this is where I'm at. This is my progress and it's looking pretty good. I think it probably could have been just a smidge smaller. So I'm not gonna, that's why I did a wearable mock-up. I wanted to fully finish it so I could see kind of what I was looking at. Like, I think I could even go like this, right? Take off that much. And then that will make it fit in a little bit tighter here along the back. I don't know. I don't know. Just trying to figure it out as I go. And it is slow going because I just don't have unlimited hours to devote to it. Um, but anyway, this is my progress update for today. We're well into September now, <laughs> September 7th, um, which means I haven't posted a video in over a month and it's taking me that long to get to where I have this done and I'm working on the top. Oh well. It's time for an update. And when I filmed it last, I was still fitting the sleeve. Then my battery ran out, so I couldn't film my process today while I was working. But I ended up cutting out the sleeve, and it turns out the sleeve was not too small. I think uh, it was pulling funny, and so I actually undid the mock-up and rotated it a little bit because I had forgotten to clip into the arm side here of where I was supposed to like put the notches on the pattern. So anyway, I had originally set the um, seam on the sleeve a little bit too far down this way. I took it off and like moved it up this way and everything fit much better. So it was just a rotation issue, but I did end up shortening the sleeve, but I added seam allowance and I have sewn the ruffles. So all I have to do now is gather this onto the bottom of the sleeve. Um, you know, sew the sleeve up and insert it into the bodice. So that's done. But then I was thinking about the back here. So on my next version of this, I'm probably going to shorten this just a little bit. It just was a little bit long to lay nicely here at that lower back. But if I add a ruffle to it, and these actually ended up being a really nice size for that, then that will hide where my petticoat um, strings are. And I think what I can do is undo this. See, I've already stitched it closed. I can undo it and machine sew this ruffle in place. And then that might eat up. I can like sew it a little bit inside the actual seam allowance and turn it back up and restitch it. I did make the stomacher, which was a quick and easy piece of this project. So it's just two pieces sewn in like envelope fashion turned and then you put in boning channels and I ended up just taking a piece of the same fabric and binding the top edge. So that's how that'll look and there'll be ties that go across here. So I've got to put in my eyelets along here. I'm going to try and get this to a place where I can finish my hand sewing in front of the TV and then this will be done. work on my hat for my 18th century costume and I did buy one of these Target hats and the issue with it is that it is about 20 inches in diameter and that's really big. I have seen online that 16 inches is also historically accurate and I think it's a better proportion so you know I'd be taking off about this much all the way around. So I'm going to start unpicking this hat to reduce the size of the brim. I'm also going to take off the top couple of rows of the crown in order to make this a little bit shallower. And then I have some 
silk, a remnant of silk that I can use to make a decoration to go around the hat. I injured myself, so this is lovely. Uh, injured myself on a mandolin yesterday, so it'll be a while before I can do really detailed work, but I think I should be able to finish this hat and then I can get worn photos of the costume as it's already completed. I'm gonna hold off on making the second bodice for now because because reasons. So I'm going to go ahead and just wrap up my accessories, wrap up this video, and start again with another project, another day. Enchanted Rose did a video where she um, altered a hat like this. It really is a pretty simple thing of just unpicking the stitching until you get to the length that you want and then securing it, you know, a little stitch to, to make sure it doesn't unravel any further. So that's 18 inches. I'm gonna try this on and see what I think about 18 inches in diameter. I'm gonna keep going. I think 16 inches is the magic number. 18 just still feels really big. That seems about right. I'm gonna go ahead and trim this off. And then I can just secure that with a few stitches right on the other side. Now, in terms of this, I think I wanna take off about an inch of height. The way I saw Enchanted Rose do that was you kind of loosen the stitching of this whole top piece and keep it as a separate flat piece. You cut down the number of rows you want and then you sew this piece back on the top. Just like that. Okay, so I've completed cutting down the brim and I think that's a much more um, appropriate height. I'm gonna go ahead and stitch this in place using a curved needle and I will be right back. There it is, all stitched back into place. So that's just about an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter, depending on where you are, of a crown and then 16 inches in diameter. That feels a lot more historically accurate, I guess. Um, it's more proportional for me anyway. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut strips of this silk and stitch them into a tube so I can hide the raw edges. And then I'm going to use the same technique that I used on my cap right here to make these little puffs all around the brim. I've marked my silk strip every two inches with a really faint pencil line. And I'm going to run a gathering stitch along those lines. That gives me this little bit of a poof here. And so if I put that up against the hat and stitch it down, it makes a nice design right there. And then when I stitch this to the hat, I'm going to probably stitch a little pearl or something right on each of those to cover that stitch line. And that'll make a nice pretty little decoration along the edge of the hat. This is old silk, by the way, and I can see some slight discoloration. There is a spot right there, some foxing on it. Uh, I've never seen a salvage that looks like this with the blue threads woven into it. So that's kind of interesting, but it is an older piece of silk, just a remnant, but it's perfect for what I need, which is just, you know, for little bits of decoration here and there. I was working on this trim and then decided that I actually wanted to take the brim down another two rows. So instead of being an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half, it is actually about three fourths of an inch. It's a much better proportion now with that. It's kind of tricky to get these things right when you don't really know what you're dealing with. But anyway, this will just stitch right back on there. It's easy enough to do. It's just I hate that I had already sewn on the top and now I have to sew it on again. <laughs> Here are some shoe clips I made to dress up a pair of cheap shoes I found on Amazon. I've said before and I'll say it again that I'm not quite ready to buy the expensive reproduction shoes. I think good enough is good enough. So I did see some examples, as you can see here, of shoes that are at the very tail end of the 18th century. Yes, they're a little more Regency than Georgian, but it's good enough for what I'm doing. So I found a pair of cheap shoes on Amazon that looked close enough, and I'm decorating them.
whatever they were on sale for 10 bucks so i did stitch the bow on just a little bit for added security and then i used hot glue to secure it the rest of the way and then i did secure some little pearls on the top with hot glue now i could have done that with e6000 and i could have sewn it on there but i have an injured finger and couldn't really sew and my e6000 is no good so this is fine they're probably going to fall off but for now it's cute <laughs> <laughs> and it brings that little bow detail from my hat and the pearls from my hat down to my shoes. And the hardware for the shoe clips is pretty inexpensive. That comes with 10 pieces, so that's enough for five pairs. That's an easy way to make your shoes be multi-purpose, as you can just change out the bow to match whatever outfit you're wearing.
So that's the end of my 18th century costume series. If you've been following along and patiently waiting, I sure appreciate it. This costume has actually been complete for a couple of weeks, and I just now had the time to put on the whole outfit and film this part of the video. You're seeing it for the first time, but so am I. This is actually the first time I've put on this finished bodice with all the other pieces. So it was really exciting for me to do that today and to share that experience with you. I really, really, really am thrilled with the overall silhouette, the overall look. I feel like I've really made something that is not only accurate to the look and feel of the 18th century, but also is wearable. These are real clothes. This is not a costume that's going to disintegrate the first time I wear it. I can wear these for a long time to come and not worry about them falling apart. That was something that struck me when I made the two 1920s dresses is that that was the first time I'd made a costume that felt like real clothing because they were, they were real dresses that people actually wore and those patterns came directly from them. Well, that's the same thing here. This is the result of a lot of other people coming before me and studying the real clothes to see how they were constructed. What were the silhouettes? How did they make the silhouette work? And what did they have to you know, go through to create the whole outfit? So I can't take any credit for any of this. I just know that I'm following in the steps of some incredibly talented, smart researchers and students of fashion that have figured out all these things ahead of me. So anyway, I'm excited about wearing this to my first outing in a couple of weeks. I feel like the hard part is out of the way. Um, I've kind of gone through this process once. I have a pattern that I know fits me. I have stays that I know fit me. Now I can build all kinds of costumes on these undergarments, on this foundation that I've already done. So I'm looking forward to making an 18th century bed gown by following 18th century instructions. So I'll share that in an upcoming video. And I'm gonna do some other things that aren't historical costuming now that I'm past this big, big project. But anyway, I appreciate you following along with me. If you like what you see here, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and be sure to follow me on Instagram so you can keep up to date with everything that's happening on this channel. And don't forget to watch the other videos in this series. There are several of them, and if you're thinking about embarking on 18th century, you can follow along with me as I make mistakes, as I learn, and as I troubleshoot the different things that I come across along the way. So again, thank you for joining me, and I hope you have a great day.